Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Well, welcome back to another episode. And I thought it would be uh, interesting to get into money scripts in a little bit more in depth. I know we talked about those in episode number eight. And we're going to um, kind of uh, start there and go in a little bit more in depth. There's going to be four different episodes on each of the categories of money scripts. So in that episode eight, if you uh, go to the financialtherapypodcast.com, that's the financialtherapypodcast.com, and you go down to episode eight, you can have a chance to download what we call the uh, KMSI, the Klontz Money Script Inventory, and it has a dash R by it. And uh, you can you can take that, and that will help inform you a little bit as we go through uh, these four different uh, categories of money scripts. But knowing that uh, you're listening to me and possibly driving or working out or doing something different, I realize to go and do that right now is not going to be possible. So what I thought I would do is go into each of these, go over the money scripts that the questions that you would be asked if you were taking inventory, and then talk a little bit about that category. So the first nine questions of the KMSI relate to one category of money script. And these questions, so the the first one says, I do not deserve a lot of money when others have less than me. And on the, the inventory, you're asked to rate that on a one to six. A one means you strongly disagree. And a six means you strongly agree. And of course, everything else is in between. A three is, I disagree a little. And a four is, oh, I agree a little. And of course, two is a disagree and five is an agree. So anything four or higher means, yeah, I I agree with that a little. So you can just think about that. You know, how do you feel about, I don't deserve a lot of money when others have less than me? The second one is rich people are greedy. How would you answer that? Would you be a a one through a three or you kind of, you disagree strongly to a little or would you be a four through a six where you agree a little to strongly agree that rich people are greedy? The third one is people get rich by taking advantage of others. How would you feel about that? The fourth is I don't deserve money. You agree with that? Disagree. The fifth is good people should not care about money. How, what do you think about that one? The sixth is it's hard to be rich and be a good person. And the seventh is the less money you have, the better life is. The eighth is money corrupts people. Agree? Disagree. And finally, the ninth one is being rich means you no longer fit in with old friends and family. So if you were taking this, you would add up your points in that. And then uh, in the second page of this, you can rank yourself. And you can find out if you don't have a problem with money avoidance, if you have one or more symptoms, if you're at risk, and if you are a full bloom person that that suffers from money avoidance. So let's talk a little bit about what money avoidance is. And again, this is this is just a category where your scripts fall. The KSMI is clinically proven to be effective and it's pretty short. There's uncovering your money scripts 
can be a much longer process than what we've just gone through. This is a way to get, get an idea, but it's certainly not comprehensive in knowing what your money scripts are. I think the easiest way to uh, do that is a free association just with a whole big list of words. What do you believe about money and government, money and children, money and parents, money and taxes. I mean, just any word. And you write down a full thought around that particular word association. And most people will have 50 to 200 money scripts. But the KSMI is something that is very tidy, very quick, and can give you a pretty accurate view of where you fall in these four major categories. So the category that we were dealing with, uh, questions one through nine, is called money avoidance. Okay, And money avoidance scripts are based on a belief that money is bad, anxiety provoking, and that rich people are greedy. So generally speaking, a person in this category just has a pretty poor view of money and money produces a lot of anxiety. That's why it's, I want to avoid it, right? <laughs> just <laughs> get it away from me. Money is a necessary evil and there's nothing too good about rich people. They're greedy. They got their money by taking advantage of others. They don't deserve money and certainly money avoiders don't believe that they deserve money. It's interesting that there's uh, occupations that are associated with each of the money categories. And we're talking about money avoidance. Uh, the other three categories are money worship, money status, and money vigilant. And we'll get into those in later episodes. But the money avoiders typically are associated with mental health professionals, which score higher than any other profession in money avoidance. So um, that's uh, kind of interesting. I, you know, I've worked with a, a lot of therapists and by and large, I don't know what percent are, but I, I'm going to guess 80% say are, are money avoidant. It's not everybody. So money avoidance uh, has been found by research with lower levels of education, income, and net worth. So there is a correlation. This is a statistical research correlation that folks with money avoidant money scripts tend to be lower educated, have lower incomes, and lower net worth. Also, singlehood and youth are significantly associated with money avoidance money scripts. Another thing that we see with the money avoidant, the money avoidant category is that this category can predict a range of self-defeating money behaviors, which would include compulsive buying disorder, hoarding disorder, financial enabling, financial denial, and workaholism. And we've talked about all those uh, disorders in previous um, episodes, so I, I won't go into those, but those are associated with money avoidant money scripts. So it probably isn't surprising then that individuals in the top tiers of wealth and income in the U.S. tend to report lower levels of money avoidance than uh, those who are mass affluent. So, you know, it makes sense, right? I don't like money. Money's evil. Money's bad. I don't want it. It would make sense that somebody with these money scripts would be in the lower income and the lower net worth level. And, and that is just associated, again, with mental health professionals 
that typically are lower income. I don't know if it's still this way, but just as of not too many years ago, the worst paying doctorate, the worst paying PhD was psychology. And I believe the average earnings of a, uh, a PhD in psychology was like 109,000 or in that range, but it was the lowest of all doctorates. So definitely a relationship, which it, it's interesting because, I mean, therapy is incredibly valuable, right? And uh, it's, it's interesting that it's among one of the lowest paid professions. So what can you do if you are a money avoider? You know, I think uh, one of the first things to do is to really get curious about your beliefs around money and to get curious about where did they come from? Where did they originate from? Because probably got various uh, parts of yourselves that don't agree with money avoidance in that uh, you have those parts that think money's bad, money's evil, rich people are, are bad and evil and greedy. And then probably you've got some other parts that may uh, wish that things were easier or wish that you did like money or that you weren't so avoidant that you would be more engaged with your money. So I think that's a place to, to get to curious about what is going on. Where did those beliefs and burdens around money avoidance come from? When did they begin? And probably, if you can trace those back, they begin in childhood. And for an unlimited number of reasons that a person may learn from their caregivers or have concluded that money's really bad. Like I said, it's just unlimited. I hate to go into specific things that could cause that because they're so limiting, but I'll give one. And just to demonstrate how these money scripts can be formed. For example, let's say you were two years old and you picked up a penny off the ground and you put it in your mouth and started chewing it. And um, your mom or your dad sees this at a distance of 10 feet, let's say, and screams and runs over to you, opens your mouth and starts fishing in your mouth. Get that money out of your mouth. Don't you know that's dirty? Oh, that will kill you. <sighs> All right. Now, I think a natural reaction for a parent who's really concerned about, A, you may be ingesting some really bad bacteria into your system, and B, you could swallow the thing and choke, right? This may not be what the little two-year-old receives, because uh, there is no filter here. And what that two-year-old is hearing is money is bad. Money will kill you. Get rid of that money. Okay? And if you think this is far-fetched, it's not. It is not at all. We, as kids, come up with how money works, what it means, and our beliefs around that typically pretty early, early in our lives. And so... Um, that child, you know, I mean, maybe the child even gets a spanking for doing that, which just further intensifies things. And can you imagine the feelings of hurt, of confusion, of anger, of fear that could come from that incident? I mean, maybe the child starts crying and, and is told, what are you crying about? If anybody ought to be crying, I should be crying or whatever, right? And you learn, boy, I had better never do that again. 
So in uh, internal family systems, we call them managers. Parts of us managers would step in and say, <laughs> we're going to keep as far from money as we possibly can. We never want to go back and experience those, those intense emotions of fear and hurt and shame that we felt in that incident. So there's no ability for that two-year-old to process this. I mean, if the, there's some phenomenal parenting going on, maybe the incident wouldn't even happen in that way, right? But certainly there could be a, an attempt to make sense of it for the child. But that's no guarantee. So you internalize that money is terrible. So... But that's part of the, the journey is uh, trying to um, find out where did this come from, right? And that's probably one of the, uh, the most effective ways of trying to get at the root of money avoidance. Other ways that you can potentially work with your uh, system around this because, you know, there's typically a lot of financial stress with the money avoiding, you know, the income can be lower. There can be stress with the bills, stress with getting enough, enough net worth for retirement. You know, overall money avoidance, avoiding money can have a real negative impact on your financial health, right? Money touches everything we do. So, um, all of this can really hold a person back from developing good money habits of earning an income that is um, uh, supportive and respectful and building net worth. So one thing to work with is trying to create rituals and Dr. Uh, Brad Klontz is, has come up with these rituals around becoming financially informed. He would suggest that you make a habit of checking your money. Now, I use a, um, a reminder app. I have an Apple phone and it's uh, called Alarmed. And there's many of these. So I set reminders to happen. Some once a week, once a day, once a month, once a year. And you might Take um, a time, maybe once a month, to, to put in a, a reminder to check on your financial situation, uh, to get into your checkbook and uh, see how you're doing, to check on your net worth. Maybe you want to check on that quarterly or yearly. Check on your investments. Check on your retirement plan. And just be aware, right? Money avoidance means I probably haven't checked on those things for <laughs> years, right? So just a time to, to check on that. If you're in business with uh, someone, to involve your partner with that or with your spouse, a uh, monthly meeting to check on how are things going. If you have a financial advisor, and I, I would recommend that you do, set uh, regular meetings with your advisor to check in. So all this can begin building awareness. And oftentimes as awareness builds, things will feel less threatening. There'll be a higher comfort level of talking about money. Sometimes the money avoidant can be like, I don't want to look because I know it's bad. And oftentimes as you're becoming more aware and learning of steps that can be more positive, things aren't so bad when you look. It's like, wow, things aren't as bad as what I thought they were. And that can decrease anxiety. So start with a ritual around being financially. Something else you can can do is to uh, do well by doing good. Come up with a list of ideas, uh, noting how money can be good for you. Think of ways it can be beneficial for the world. 
Think about examples of uh, philanthropic pursuits. How can you use money to do good? You know, that's something you can talk about with your spouse. You can talk about with your financial advisor. But begin to reframe money as not being evil, right? Money isn't good or bad. Money isn't positive or negative. It's what we do with it that is good or bad. It's what we do with it that can be positive or negative. Money just is similar to an emotion. There's not good or bad emotions. There's just emotions. And then finally, <laughs> I'm going to say a bad word, budget. I like to think of it in terms of a spending plan. Start looking at a spending plan. This is again becoming aware of your money. There's one that um, we use called first step. But there's many uh, spending plans that, that you can adopt, plans you can put on your phone that will help you become aware of your money. How are you spending your money? Uh, this is so important. It can really, really empower you when you become aware. So, and again, this is something to approach gently. You don't want to strong arm yourself into this. You don't want to shame yourself into doing this. Like, yes, shame on you. You're not budgeting. You don't have a spending plan. It's really important to begin to look at the positives that this can do and the freedom that this can bring for you and, and uh, your loved ones. And again, you can work with uh, professionals to accomplish this. Probably the best professional to work with, <laughs> ironically, is a financial therapist, right? Which is kind of their specialty in looking at the linking of money and emotions. So, so I hope this has been uh, helpful to you. And uh, we will continue with this series and uh, take a look at... Um, the other three categories. So, thank you and uh, look forward to being with you next time. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.